Good morning, family. It is good to see you. It really is. Uh, I, I'm just amazingly blessed when I come in here and I see my friends, my family, uh, those who have been blood-bought by the death of the King of Kings, who have been purchased, who were chosen before the foundation of the world, and we get to be together as a family praising this great King. So welcome. Glad that you are here. If you're a visitor in the seat back in front of you should be an information card. Uh, feel free to grab one of those. And the last part of that, Clint's got one holding up there. The last part of that is a perforated section that you can tear off. And you can leave that, fill it out, leave it on your seat. This will give us a little information about you. We can send you a letter, uh, contact you a little bit maybe. And if you've got any questions that we can answer, that you put those on there so we can know about you. Uh, you like I said, you can leave that in your seat. Or uh, there also are offering boxes by either door as you're heading out. You can pop it in one of those. But either way, we'd love to get to know you a little bit better. Welcome. Glad that you are here this morning. I'll turn your attention to the bulletin here for a few moments as we get started today. 
Uh, new memory verse. I'm, I'm not going to try to memorize this one in this ESV. I think I've got mine in New American Standard, but this is a great one to start the new year. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What will you be setting your minds on this new year? It will determine a lot about how this new year goes for you. So set your mind on things above. I encourage you to do that. Uh, we've got a list of uh, different prayer items there. But the last one is to be praying for the Wheeler Richardson family as Shirley has passed. And Mike wanted me to express his uh, deepest thank you to this family for coming around him in love and the whole family in love and uh, providing the food and, and just caring for this, uh, this family during their time of loss. And so from the Richsons and Wheelers, thank you uh, to you, uh, church family. Uh, look on the other side there. Let's see here. A stewardship reminder. We, we're getting more and more spills in here. And uh, so please, if you bring a drink in, put a lid on your, your cup. Parents, if you bring in snacks, please try to make it not messy. You know, it's also meant to be used. So this isn't a, uh, a holy place in the sense that all places are holy. This is a place where the church gathers. This is not the church. We are the church. But at the same time, we want to take care of this place. And so please be mindful of that. And also, if you wouldn't mind, um, this isn't a movie theater, so police your own trash as you head out. Of course, they probably would appreciate that there as well, especially if they know you're a Christian. So go for it. Um, let's see here. Communion next Sunday. We will be taking communion as well as, don't forget, that is when we take up the deacon's benevolence offering. That is how we seek to meet needs within the, the people of our church's body here. When uh, car breaks down, difficult times happen here as a church, uh, we are able to, the deacons are able to provide funds a different thing, for different things that happen. And so uh, be considering that as we head toward uh, the deacons' benevolence offering as well as communion. Uh, dinner and a movie. It doesn't have the date on here, and so it, it almost reads like it's tonight, I think. But it isn't tonight. This is in two weeks. In two weeks, we will have, be watching the documentary that has just been put out called A Storm Comes Rolling Down the Plain. And this is about the call for us as the church to, to strive to abolish abortion, to end this Holocaust that is taking place in our nation, and about what many believers are doing and uniting together to, to abolish this blight on our land and this curse to our country. And so Kevin will actually be preaching that Sunday morning, and then the evening will be a time of we'll eat some pizza together beforehand, we'll watch the movie, and then afterwards will be a time for discussion, a little bit of Q&A. And so if you are planning to come so that we can plan for pizza and whatnot, if you would sign up in the foyer out there on the table, we would appreciate that so we can know who all is going to be here for that. I'll also be noticing here that we will be feeding the college uh, BCM again this semester. And so if you would like to help out with that, either with coming and helping to serve or with possibly preparing food, there are the dates on there as well as sign up out in the foyer. Um, in the insert you have is a two-sided insert. One is on Abolition Day, and that was when we go to the Capitol to remind our legislators of the truth of God and to call them to repentance and to call them to enacting laws in our land that are righteous and honoring to the King of Kings, as well as to human beings created in the image of God. And so that's going to the Capitol Abolition Day. The other side has the, uh, the Iron Men Summit. Men, if you haven't signed up, please do online and then let us know if you're coming so that we can make sure that we have rides available for that. And then just a, a couple of things here that uh, are not in your bulletin. Uh, many of you have picked these up, but straight back through those doors, are five Bible reading plans. I know some of you have had several contact me and different folks starting things. Let, again, let this year be the year that you strive by God's grace, resolve to set your mind on things above, to get into his word. Uh, as I'm reading through Isaiah, I'm just being reminded of the, the majesty and the glory of God over all nations. This is his world. It is moving toward his end. Nations are not autonomous. God is autonomous. And nations are at his disposal, disposal for his commands, what he wills. And ultimately, he will be the judge and he is the king. And so, um, anyway, there's all kinds of different plans for some for every single day. One is just the New Testament, a five by five by five. And so there's different ways that you can dig into that. Some are designed to 
take you three years. Would that be awesome? And here's one of the things. If, if you don't aim at reading your Bible, you're going to hit exactly what you're aiming for. Nothing. Okay? So aim. It'd be better to resolve for this and, and try than to not even try. You know, because I would rather stumble through it over two or three years or even ten years than really never get there. Um, so get through the Word. Last thing I want to mention. There was... Um, a law that was enacted yesterday in Canada. I know you're thinking, what does that matter? Well, Canada's probably a few years ahead of us as far as the, the evil that is taking place within their government. Um, but we're, we're quickly following that direction. Um, but as of yesterday, they enacted a law called, uh, well, a bill, C-4. And it, um, it codifies in the land that it is a criminal act to try to convince somebody outside of a biblical ethic of sexuality and marriage. And um, <clears throat> some of the pastors there wrote John MacArthur, and he has put out a call to us here in the States to join with our brothers and sisters in Canada next Sunday on preaching uh, what God's standard is for biblical morality, not biblical morality, but sexual morality, sexuality, marriage. And so next Sunday, I'm going to be tackling that but listen to what one of the things in this letter is, is this. is According to Canadian law, Canadian law, as of January 8th, so yesterday, the belief in God's design for marriage and sexuality will be known as a myth. Okay, So that is now codified in Canadian law that it is a myth. And so the call here, and this is from one of the Canadian brothers, he says this, on January 16th, 2022, faithful men across this country and many in the United States as well will be preaching on God's design for marriage and a biblical ethic of sexuality. We will be doing so illegally, declaring to the state that there is one God and one Lord over his church, and that Christ alone gets to both define marriage and dictate what is required in the pulpit. And we are, many pastors here in the States are standing with them saying, absolutely, amen. We will preach the truth of God and his word. Um, and so John MacArthur has urged many of us. I want to put here, uh, mention just a couple things out of John's letter. He said this, Our calling as gospel ministers is to preach the truth, confront sin, and call all men to repentance and obedience to the gospel. The good news that achieves soul conversion and saves sinners from eternal wrath. <clears throat> Last thing. He says this, This world system and its human governments will gladly send people to hell. But our calling is to rescue people with the truth. And so that's why we would stand on this. It's not, we don't hate people, we love people. We of all people love people, or should. And that means calling, pointing out the truth of God's word on all these matters, not just these issues, but many, many others. And so I want to ask you to, to be praying with me. Pray for our brothers and sisters in Canada. Pray for us here in the United States as, uh, as there are laws being enacted more and more. Um, in our land to, to codify evil, to codify things, to, to legitimize things that are um, literally damning people to hell. And, uh, and we need to stand united, whatever that cost may be, um, because we love God and we love people. And the worst thing we could do is keep our mouth shut to the truth of his word. And so stand with me in prayer and uh, and. Preaching the truth. Share the gospel at work. Share it with your, your worker, your co your, your coworker, your neighbor, your, your family. And uh, preach the message of Jesus Christ that he loves us and laid down his life that sinners just like us can be forgiven. This morning as I was um, praying for this service, I was praying through Psalm 9. And I thought the end of it was very apropos to what we were just discussing here in Psalm 9, starting verse 15, it says this, The nations have sunk down in the pit which they have made. In the net which they hid, their own foot has been caught. Yahweh has made himself known. He has executed judgment. In the work of his own hands, the wicked is snared. The wicked will return to Sheol and all nations who forget God. For the needy will not always be forgotten nor the hope of the afflicted perish forever. Arise, O Yahweh, do not let man prevail. 
Let the nations be judged before you. Put them in fear, O Yahweh. Let the nations know that they are but men. Let's pray. Father, we are just simply men, men and women. You are God. It is not up for us to define what is right and wrong. It is not up for us to determine anything like that. You're you're God. It is before your throne of judgment that every one of us will stand. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and every government on this earth belongs to you. This world is yours and all that dwell therein. And so, Lord, we call upon you, the almighty King of glory, to intervene. Would you rise up your church, Lord, with faithfulness to your word, to walk in holiness, to proclaim the truth, to proclaim your glory among the nations. Father, I pray for what may come down the road here for our Canadian brothers and sisters um, as the government is standing opposed and calling a myth the biblical truth of, of morality. Father, would you strengthen them? Would you help them to in love, preach the truth of Jesus Christ. Would you help us to unite with them? And even here in our land, Father, where there are so many immoralities that are protected and glorified, would you help us to stand for the truth, to love our neighbor and to tell them the truth of you, of you, of your word. So thank you, Father, for this morning. Thank you for saving people just like us, sinners. Sinners who deserve your wrath, but instead get lavished with your kindness. Thank you, Lord, for your love. And it's in Christ's powerful, beautiful, surpassing, and hopefully soon coming name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, This next song we are going to sing is Shout to the North. And um, the men will sing the first verse, the women will sing the second verse. So let's stand and sing that together. Shout to the north. Men of faith rise up and sing of the great and glorious King. You are strong when you feel weak, in your brokenness complete. And we will shout to the north and the south, sing to the east and the west. Jesus is Savior to all, He's Lord of heaven and earth. Our God who reigns on high by 
His grace again will flow. Rise up, church, with broken wings. Fill this place with songs again. Of our God who reigns on high. By His grace again will fly. And we will shout. Give him 
be continuing in 2 Samuel. We're almost finished with that book, and then, Lord willing, we will be starting in the book of Luke in February. But to uh, preview or to go along with 2 Samuel, let me read Joshua chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. This is the Word of God. Be strong and courageous, For you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give to them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. But you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed. For Yahweh, your God, is with you wherever you go. Let's pray. Father, that's a, uh, a great call for us today, to meditate upon your word, that it may be what fills our minds and our mouths, so that we may align our lives according to it, 
It does not matter, Father, what this world says. You are God. It doesn't matter what this world says is right and wrong or how it might seek to cause us or try to cause us to be silent. You, Father, have given us your truth, your word. You have given us your spirit to empower us. You have set us free from the power of sin. You have set us free to life with the King, the Lord God Almighty. Lord, would you help us to receive your word this morning, to be changed by being in your presence from hearing you speak to us. So Father, now speak to us through your word. Use your servant, Kyle, to be a faithful proclaimer of your truth. May you receive all the glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with you guys and sharing God's Word with you. Uh, it is the beginning of a brand new year, pretty much. Uh, is anybody already behind in your daily Bible reading plan? Nobody wants to admit that. So if you are, uh, praise God for His grace. Like Ryan said earlier, keep plugging away. If you aim at nothing, you're going to hit that every time. Um, I want to, again, echo what Ryan challenged us to do a couple of weeks ago and then just now is that make it, make it a habit, make it your resolve, your resolution to get into God's Word every day this year. We are called to love God, and we cannot love Him without knowing Him, and we can't know God without first knowing His Word. And so soak up God's Word this year. Live in it. Uh, check out one of the Bible reading plans he mentioned. Uh, lots of good ones there. Did you know, uh, this is free info for you, there are 1,189 chapters in the Bible, 1,189 chapters. And if you average reading four chapters a day, just six days a week, you will read through the whole Bible in a little bit less than a year. So I challenge you to do that. Um, one guy who really challenged me when I was a college student, Don Rutledge is a guy who immediately started challenging me to hide God's word in his heart. But another one I want to mention is Chris Robinson. Some of you know him as he was moving over to Indonesia with his wife to share the gospel there. Um, challenged me to get in the word and gave me this little black book. And we would write verses and passages down that we were memorizing at the time. And he wrote something in here. I don't know if this is original Chris Robinson or if he got it from somebody else. I couldn't find a resource, but I'm going to read what he wrote from my notes here because it's kind of chicken scratch in here. Uh, In ancient Rome, a typical battle formation under Camillus would involve three lines, the Hestati, the Principes in the middle, and then the Triarii in the back. The Triarii were were basically the last line of defense. They were the backbone of the Roman army at this time. They were battle-hardened warriors who had earned the rights to hold the third line. To be Triarii was, was an honor as a part of the Roman war machine. Uh, They had to be steadfast under intense opposition, and they had to remain cool-headed at all times. Not only did they instill courage in the two front lines of younger troops by having their backs, where that phrase comes from, they also acted as shock troops who would rush forward when needed uh, to enable these battered front lines to retreat and then regroup and reform. And so when when the triarchy were called forward, that meant the battle is it's, it's desperate. This is the last thread holding it together. And so the phrase here, I believe on the screen maybe, is inde rem ad triarios redisi, or it has come to the triarii. And so that came to mean, mean that the situation is dire. Like this is our last hope that we have here. And it was a well-known expression throughout the Latin-speaking world. And then Chris goes on to write this. When we fight the spiritual battle of life on earth for the king of kings, he has a need of such men and women, those who will be the backbone of the church, veterans of spiritual war who are the bride's last line of defense. When we memorize God's word in our hearts, we become spiritual triarii. The last line of defense for us is the mental arsenal that we have stored up in our our hearts and our minds with which we can successfully battle against sin and temptation and error. He goes on to say, these are dark times. It has come to the triarii. The church needs spiritual triarii, saints who are soaked through and through with the blood of the living word. We need to pass on to the younger warriors this treasure of God's word 
as well as we memorize it. And then he ends with this. God is sovereign, and we are responsible to act. So we work. We ready ourselves to do battle in the spiritual war against sin. And with joy, we march forward against impossible odds, knowing with certainty that ultimately the battle belongs to the Lord. I love that. This morning, we will see a list of men who embodied this type of godly courage to help God's chosen king, David, lead his people, Israel. And my prayer here for us is that as a result of what we see this morning, that we would grow in our knowledge of who God is, of what he has done, what he has promised us, so that we will be able to also live out the biblical courage to live for him in the midst of a fallen world. Divide up the rest of 2 Samuel 23 into four sections. We're going to first see three named men in verses 8 through 12, then three unnamed men, and then two honorable mentions, and then sort of a, a laundry list of the rest. So let's start out by looking at three named men, and y'all pray for me. I've been practicing these names all week, so here we go. 2 Samuel chapter 23, verses 8 through 12, three named men. These are the names of the mighty men whom David had, Joshua Beshebeth, a Tekemanite, he was chief of the three. He wielded his spear against 800, whom he killed at one time. And next to him among the three mighty men was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, son of Ohohai. He was with David when they defied the Philistines who were struck, who were gathered there for battle, and the men of Israel withdrew. And he rose and struck down the Philistines until his hand was weary, and his hand clung to the sword. And the Lord, Yahweh, brought about a great victory that day, and the men returned after him only to strip the slain. And next to him was Shammah, the son of Agi, the Herorite. The Philistines gathered together at Lehi, where there was a plot of land, a ground full of lentils. And the men fled from the Philistines, but he took his stand in the midst of the plot and defended it and struck down the Philistines. And the Lord, Yahweh, worked a great victory." Now, maybe you know that David's mighty men were known as the 30 because there were roughly 30 serving under David in this elite group at any given time. And we'll see at the end of this list, we have 37 in total there. But what we have here in these three men really are the best of the best, the elite of the elite. And we're given just a brief example as to why they were seen as such. The first is Josheb Bashebeth. It says he was the chief, the leader of this smaller elite group of men, and he took a spear and not only did he kill 800 men, he killed 800 men at one time, as long as if that's not miraculous enough there. I don't know if it was a fully automatic assault spear, but he did it. Uh, we also see Eleazar. We don't know any details except what we see here in this passage. At one point in a battle against the Philistines, when all the other Israelites flee away for self-preservation, Eleazar, he stands up and he fights them off himself. He fights for so long with so much fury that his hand clings to his sword. The NIV says that his hand froze to his sword. Uh, we use uh, wood to heat our house a lot of times in the winter and we run a chainsaw. And I remember one time I ran a chainsaw for so long, I didn't notice how fatigued my arm was until I put the chainsaw down and my hand immediately began just my muscles involuntarily contracting and I couldn't open my hand for some time, and I imagine that's just a glimpse, like this guy's hand was frozen to his sword as he ferociously fights off this army. And notice what it says in verse 10. I can't miss this. It says, the Lord Yahweh brought about a great victory that day, and only then do the other warriors come back to strip the slain and get the spoil. Next we have Shammah. Here the Philistines were gathered again, maybe to either steal or to destroy a lentil crop, which these farmers would have needed and depended on for food and for trade, and possibly also the, the Israelite army to feed them. And again, as all the other people flee in self-preservation and fear, Shammah takes his stand in the middle of the field, and he kills these Philistines. We don't know how many, but we know it is a great feat. And again, notice the repetition in verse 12, this idea, and the Lord Yahweh works a great victory. And I'll spend more time talking about the implications of these verses once we get through verse 23. But for now, we need to know that the point here is not simply, not merely to highlight human courage, 
to give us an example to follow so that we can see victory whenever we face hard times. Is that a takeaway? Maybe, but that's not the point. To make that the point is to rip the passage out of its context, to bypass the gospel-centered hermeneutic which, which, with which we should be reading Scripture always. The whole point is to show here it is God who works the victory. That's what First and Second Samuel has been all about. It is God who works the victory. We'll talk more about that later, but for now, let's look at the second section of this passage in verses 12, um, 13 through 17. We see three unnamed men. And three of the 30 chief men went down and came about harvest time to David at the cave of Adullam, where a band, when a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephaim. David was then in the stronghold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then at Bethlehem. And David said longingly, Oh, that someone would give me water to drink from the well of Bethlehem that is by the gates. Then the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and carried it and brought it to David, but he would not drink it. He poured it out to the Lord Yahweh and said, Far be it from me, O Yahweh, that I should do this. Shall I drink the blood of the men who went at risk of their lives? Therefore, he would not drink it. These things the three mighty men did. Now, we don't know who these guys are, and we don't know exactly when this account happened, if it was when David was on the run from Saul, or maybe after he became king and he's engaging in a campaign against the Philistines. But either way, we have the setting. They're, they're holed up in the cave of Adullam, which is a, a natural kind of fortress. And you can even go and see the cave today. And these Philistines had taken control of the outlying area. They'd taken control of Bethlehem, and they'd set up a garrison or a military outpost there. And now David, we've got to keep in mind, he's not literally asking, hey, will someone go get me some water from Bethlehem there? Now, the enemy is in Bethlehem. That's David's hometown. That's the place where David was anointed king, his family home there. I think he was more longing uh, for this place, longing to say, man, that we would be back in control and these Philistines would be out of here than he was just saying, hey, I'm thirsty. Please get me some water. But these three unnamed men, they hear David, they're king, and, and they're so committed to David, so committed that they will do anything to boost his morale, to lift his spirits as their king, as their leader. So what do they do? They go from Adullam to Bethlehem. That's 12 and a half miles. And think of this area, this topography. It's a very mountainous terrain. And they don't sneak in. They fight their way through the Philistine camp. And then they go draw water. And they go hike another 12 and a half miles back to David in the cave. That's like walking from Tahlequah to Keys and back, only more mountainous, while fighting through enemy lines for a drink of water. And this act of devotion is so shocking to David, the, the great risk these men took, that, that he knew, and th this water, this gift is far too precious for me to enjoy. And so instead, he pours it out, the text says, as an offering to God. This wasn't an act of waste. Some people have said, oh, it's just David saying, I'm going to throw that out because you all were dumb and you, you did a foolish risk. No, he's pour this is an act of worship as he pours this out to the Lord. One quick takeaway from this before we move on. We need community. Like David had these men, we need people who will rally behind us, who will strengthen our spirits when they are low. We need to also look for opportunities to do that for others around us as well. Maybe you uh, remember Galatians 6, 2, where Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says, bear one another's burdens, and so what? Fulfill the law of Christ. That's not a suggestion, church. That is a command to all of us. 2 Samuel 23, here in this chapter, it reminds us that David, he didn't attain victory over his enemies on his own. Yes, it was God doing it ultimately, but we also see God gives the resources that we need to do what God has called us to do. So ultimately, David is a foreshadowing of Jesus, the true king and deliverer his people need. But David is also a real historical man who was called to save God's people in real historical ways. And God provided David with these faithful men who were then used in incredible ways to help David do what God called David to do. Maybe you've heard the, the famous uh, statement that goes along well with missions movement that, that God doesn't call the equipped. He equips those he calls. So, so here we see that in just one tangible way that God equips David 
with faithful men who trusted God enough to take a stand against all odds. Church, if you want to get serious about growing in your relationship with Christ, about being more fruitful for God's kingdom, you cannot overlook, you cannot neglect Christian community. The community found in the local church, that is one of the most important means that God gives us to help us grow closer to him, to help us grow in our courage and our commitment to his kingdom and to be used by him. Are you investing in that? A very simple way, an easy plug, join a community group. Be around people and go deep in God's word and pray for one another. Uh, The one that I lead is going to meet at our house about an hour after church. Bring your lunch. We'll hang out and study scripture. We'll pray together, encourage one another. Ryan's is also going to meet here at church uh, today, and then Bobby's will meet next week. Join a community group. It's a great way to do that. This year, make it a priority to build meaningful, Christ-centered relationships with other people in this church. Find accountability partners. Find people to pray for and to pray with. Find people that don't have family around here and open up your home, open up your life, and and be their family. There's a reason through the New Testament we see over and over again this, this family language being used among God's people. Younger people, find older people and learn from their wisdom and life experience. And older saints, find younger ones and encourage them. Befriend them and teach them about life. Christian community is vital, so please invest in it for your sake. On to our next point here, number three, we'll see two honorable mentions in verses 18 through 23. Now Abishai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zeruiah, was chief of the 30, and he wielded his spear against 300 men and killed them and won a name beside the three. He was the most renowned of the 30, and he became their commander, but he did not attain to the three. And Benaiah, the son of Joida, was a valiant man of Kabzael, a doer of great deeds. He struck down Ariel, two Ariels of Moab. He also went down and struck down a lion in a pit on a day when snow had fallen. And he struck down an Egyptian, a handsome man. The Egyptian had a spear in his hand, but Benaiah went down to him with a staff and snatched the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. These things did Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and won a name beside the three mighty men. He was renowned among the thirty, but he did not attain to the three. And David set him over his bodyguard. So we see two more names here. Abishai, who was over the entire group of mighty men. We see here that he killed 300 men with a spear. It doesn't say if it was at one time or not. Um, but, But even still, he did not attain to that status of that first list of those elite three. And then Benaiah. We see here, he is a bad dude. You do not want to mess with this guy. He strikes down two Ariels, which most likely the Hebrew word there means lion-like men of Moab. So fierce warriors there. And he also struck down a lion in a pit because why not, I guess? Uh, Doesn't tell us. We honestly don't know. Um, I'm sure David, who as a shepherd boy, killed bears and lions to defend his flock, probably really appreciated that little story there. Uh, he also killed an Egyptian man. Uh, my ESV version there, it, it says a handsome man. Hang on, that's strange. Uh, the Hebrew word there literally means one who has sight. And so probably in the context, it's the eye was drawn to him. Everybody saw him. So he is large, intimidating. He is imposing. So he's probably this mighty warrior guy. Benai is in a fight with him. Uh, and he takes his spear and kills him with his own spear. And he is put in charge of David's personal bodyguard. So again, he's given lots of clout and status, but even he did not attain to the status of the three, which tells us how bad those three guys probably were, bad in a good way. Uh, And then we see great feats here. As we see great feats in these verses, I kind of want to give a few words of warning here as we unfold this, some warning for us. First of all, remember the purpose of these chapters, of these verses, of these commendations. These last few chapters of 2 Samuel have really been serving as an appendix to the life of David that looks back on the victories that he's accomplished, keyword, through the power of God. We can't make these mighty men the purpose of the passage. Yes, we can draw life lessons from each of them and use them as examples, but their inclusion in the the overarching narrative of this has to be taken into consideration with what this book is about. 
What's this book about? Go back to 1 Samuel chapter 2. Not by might shall a man prevail. God is going to establish his king. God is going to do the work here. So these men did great things from which we can draw great applications by looking back at their courage. But this all points back to David, who ultimately points to the Messiah, our true eternal King Jesus. So remember the purpose. Number two, success may not be what you expect. In this passage, we see people working great accomplishments under God's power. My mind was immediately taken to Hebrews 11 as I'm studying this, which show us we see this, this hall of fame of people of the faith. And then toward the end of the chapter, we see people who do amazing things. They stop the mouths of lions. They raise the dead. They conquer kingdoms. They escape the edge of the sword. And we go, yeah, sign me up. I want that. But what's it go on to say afterward? Right after in Hebrews 11, it says, we see countless others who didn't get the same success in human terms. Instead, they were successful in obeying God even as they suffered. Here's what it says, mocking and flogging and chains and imprisonments, being stoned, being sawn in two, killed with a sword, going about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, wandering in deserts and mountains in dens and caves of the earth. We still ready to sign up for that? Looking at this list here in 2 Samuel 23, church, your, your name may never be written in a list like this. Go, man, what a rock star, what a great warrior of, of the kingdom this person was. But take heart, because if you are in Christ, Isaiah 49 says that God has, himself has written your name on the palm of his hand, and that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life from before the foundation of the world. That's awesome. That is something worth rejoicing in. Before we move on, though, the last section, I want to talk about biblical courage, what it is and what it isn't. See, courage, it means doing something difficult, doing something risky. If it's not risky, it probably really isn't courage, right? I mean, we see over and over again in the media how these famous people do something stunning and brave. Stunning and brave by rejecting biblical truth and adopt some belief that everybody else in the culture at large already agrees with. That's not stunning and brave. All that is is going with the flow. That's cowardice. That's self-preservation. Biblical courage, it means taking risk, and it often appears to be foolish or foolhardy to others, especially the world. And if it doesn't appear foolish, again, it may not be courage. There's a quote here on the screen, I think. Uh, It's often attributed to C.S. Lewis, but uh, as I look back, it's, it's actually not from him. No one knows who it's from that I could tell, um, but it's still a good quote. So here it is. Uh, When the whole world is running toward a cliff, he who is running in the opposite direction appears to have lost his mind. I love that. I I think that we can use some holy imagination. We can picture all the Israelites who are running away from the Philistines while Eleazar is the one guy running in the opposite direction toward the enemy. And what are they thinking? Are 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 they saying to him, what are you doing? Run away. We've lost. We're outnumbered. The battle's over. You're going to die, you idiots. Or the others who ran away while Shammah stood in a field calling out to him, like, are you really going to die for a field of beans? Is it worth it to you to do that? One of my favorite authors, Arthur W. Pink, hopefully it's on the screen here, says, when through unbelief, lack of zeal, or the fear of man, the rank and file of professing Christians are giving way before the forces of evil. He says, then is the opportunity for those who know and trust the Lord to be strong and do exploits, do amazing things there. Biblical courage and being foolhardy, they may appear to be very similar at certain points, but there is a world of difference between them. You see, foolishness, foolhardiness, it, it, it could be rushing into things without thinking, without thought, or acting rashly from wrong motives. Biblical courage is distinguished in two ways, one of two ways from foolishness. First of all, it is founded upon God's truth. should be on the screen here, I believe. And it's also, too, it's motivated by God's glory. Biblical courage is founded upon the truths of God plainly revealed in his word. It's not rash. It's not thoughtless. It may appear to be irrational to the world, but it's anything but 
irrational. Jesus himself tells us in Luke 14, 28, you want to follow me? Count the cost. You want to build something? You better realize, you better figure out, is it worth it to you? Think about that. So when you as a follower of Christ, when your back is up against the wall and your options are, one, given to the demands of a godless society or do what doesn't make sense to them and obey God instead, our choice has to be based on our resolve and our commitment to the truth. So that, what, what does that look like? It means God has said, so I'm going to do. It may not make sense to you. I don't have to explain it. It may not make sense to me. God has said, I will do. God has said, it's not up for debates. And notice too, I think one good takeaway is that our resolve and our commitment to the truth, truth does not mean that we will know the outcome. You don't know what's going to happen. Think about Martin Luther. When he st- stands before uh, the, on trial, the Diet of Worms, before the two most important, most powerful men of that time, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire and the pope, and he was commanded to recant his statements about the Bible and the church. And here's just a little excerpt on the screen, I think, of what he says. This isn't all of it, but this is kind of the closing here. He says, Since your most serene majesty and your lordships require of me a simple, clear, and direct answer, I will give one. And it is this, unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures and by clear reason, goes on to say, I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not retract anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. And Martin Luther knows that can get him killed with a, with a snap of a finger. And he ends with, here I stand, I can do no other. So help me, God, or God help me. Amen. He, he, he doesn't know what's going to happen to him, but he knows what God has said. And his commitment is to that. Biblical courage is founded upon the truths of God's word, not on the fickle, changing views of the world. So it's founded on God's truth. Number two, biblical courage is motivated by the glory of God. It has to be. Foolhardiness is motivated by glory for self, for reputation. We see in 1 Samuel 17 where David the unassuming shepherd boy, he doesn't have a desire to make a name for himself. Instead, he was zealous for God's name. He is furious when a Philistine giant mocks God's name while the Israelite army abdicates their role of defending God's honor and fighting in fear of him. You see, biblical courage, it may result in single-handedly killing 800 of God's enemies, as we see with Josheb Bathshebeth. It might, or it may result in what we see in Acts 7, where Stephen is murdered in broad daylight by an angry mob of religious leaders. And here's a key point. For most people, being brave and courageous, it only seems like a good idea after the fact, after you've won the victory and the dust settles there. When they look back and see, hey, that worked out after all. Before that, it just seems foolish. Let me put it in some practical terms, some some ways I think that we can uh, put the rubber to the road here. Biblical courage, it means willing to be called a sexist just because you believe that a woman does not have the right to murder a human being growing inside of her womb. Biblical courage, it means being willing to be called hateful and unreasonable, backward, fundamental bigot because you define gender and sexuality and marriage and holiness the way that God clearly does in Scripture. Biblical courage means maybe risking a friendship or being willing to be called a Pharisee or judgmental when you see a friend who is wandering off into sin and say, hey, this is going to be awkward, but I love you too much. I care about you too much to not say anything to you. It may mean being willing to risk not being included in the cool crowd or be overlooked at work or whatever else because you won't compromise on what God has said. You won't pursue or be entertained by what they are. Biblical courage ultimately says, I will do whatever I have to do so that God is glorified here. No matter what happens, if God is glorified in my victory, awesome, praise God. If he's glorified in my death where I crash and burn, awesome, praise God. We see this beautifully shown, I think it's on the screen here, 2 Samuel chapter 10, verses 9 through 12. Joab, the captain of David's army, says this, or when Joab saw that the battle was set against him, both in front and in the rear, he chose some of the best men of Israel, and he arrayed them against the Syrians, 
The rest of his men he put in the charge of Abishai, his brother, and he arrayed them against the Ammonites. And he said, if the Syrians are too strong for me, then you shall help me. But if the Ammonites are too strong for you, then I will come and help you. So what's happening here? They're surrounded. Like there's no way out of this. And I love, love, love verse 12. He says, be of good courage and let us be courageous for our people and for the cities of our God. And may God, may the Lord do what seems good to him. We're going to fight tooth and nail. We're going to do whatever we have to do, but it's in God's hands. And we're okay with that. I mentioned earlier those saints in Hebrews 11 who were killed and scattered and persecuted, who didn't see success as the world would define it. And here's a crucial truth that we can take away from this is that you cannot measure obedience by success. You can't measure obedience by outcomes. That only results in shallow pragmatism when you focus on numbers to justify what you do or what you don't do. Think of evangelism. I mean, how many times do we, you share the gospel and someone just says, no, no thanks, and you go, man, that didn't work. Well, yeah, but you're obedient. That's a victory for you. You are being faithful to God's call to make disciples to preach the gospel. So we preach even if they say, no thanks. Or think about in acts of mercy to others. I mean, some of you may have done that. You've opened up your home, your life, you've given your resources, and you get taken advantage of. You get burned. Do you go, well, that didn't work out. I'm never doing that again. No, because the Bible commands us to share our lives and our resources with those in need. Don't measure obedience by the outcomes. Obedience is defined by trusting in God's word and doing what he says regardless of the outcome. We can all think of people in, the, in God's church who have attained some sort of a renown like we see in this chapter with these commendations. Think of you know, the, the pillars of the Reformation or the Great Awakening or famous missionaries or pastors, theologians, bloggers, whatever today. I, I want to offer you both a challenge and a warning about this before we move on. The challenge for you to take away is this. Seek to do like these men. Seek to do great things for God. Don't put yourself, I'm sorry, put yourself, put yourself in uncomfortable situations, even risky ones where God can be glorified in your life. I'm not saying just be foolish and foolhardy. Make sure it's grounded upon the truths of God's word and upon his glory, but put yourself in risky situations and watch him work through and in spite of your weaknesses and shortcomings. So, so seek, aspire to do great things for God. But on the other side of that is a warning as well. Don't buy into the lie that if the thing that God is calling you to do isn't worth writing a book about or writing poems about, then it's not worth doing. I think our culture especially younger generations have really bought into that. Like it's either got to be world changing or nothing at all. That's a lie. Maybe what God is calling you to do is something that seems so boring and so mundane and so just unnoteworthy, like fighting your sin, growing in holiness, or raising and faithfully discipling kids at home, or sharing the gospel with your coworker, or inviting a college student over to your house for a home-cooked meal and a break away from a smelly, loud dorm. We're taking a widow or a widower out for coffee just because, just to begin a relationship with them, a friendship with them. It doesn't matter if you end up like the people in this chapter and you get the three who have an entire paragraph devoted to you or some other obscure name that we're going to see that is never written about anywhere else. If you are in Christ, your life can and your life must, your life must glorify God, especially in those small little mundane acts of obedience that no one else will see. Christians, God sees them, and he is pleased by your faithfulness, and he will use it in ways that you will never know about on this side of eternity. Be faithful. Our last section shows us men like this who they don't get elaborate details about what they did, but they were faithful, and they honored God. So the last section we see here is the list of the rest in verses 29 through 39. Say an extra quick prayer for me real quick. Here we go. Asahel, the brother of Joab, was one of the 30. Elhanan, the brother of Dodo of Bethlehem, Shammah of Herod, Elikah of Herod, Helaz the Paltite, Ira the son of Ikesh of Tekoa, Abiezar of Anathoth, Mabunai the Hushethite, Zaman the Ahohite, Meharoi of Natopha, Helab the son of Baana of Natopha, 
Ittai, the son of Ribai of Gibeah, of the people of Benjamin, Benaiah of Pirathon, Hidei of the brooks of Gash, Abialbon, the Arbathites, Asmaveth of Behurim, Eliaba, the Shaalbanites, the sons of Jashan, Jonathan, Shama, the Hararites, Ahiam, the son of Shar, the Hararites, Eliph, Elith, the son of Ahazbi, of Maacah, Eliam, the son of Ahithophel, the Gilanite, Hezro of Carmel, Pairai, the Arbites, Igal, the son of Nathan of Zobah, Bani the Gadite, Zelak the Ammonites, Naharai of Beeroth, the armor bearer of Joab, the son of Zeruiah, Ira the Ithrite, Gareb the Ithrites, Uriah the Hittite, 37 in all. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for getting me through that. <laughs> oh, stop. You're making me blush here. Uh, these men, now I'm going to like crash and burn just to God to humble me here in a second. <laughs> Some of these men are only mentioned in this passage. We, we have nothing else about them, but between here and the companion passage we see in 1 Chronicles 11. So while we don't get the details of their action, though, we do see here they are faithful men whom God uses to establish David as God's chosen king and to help David to lead and protect and bless his people. A, a name you might remember here is Asahel from verse 24. He's named as the brother of Joab. Kind of a side note here, um, Joab isn't mentioned here. A, a lot of commentators believe that he's mentioned indirectly as Asahel's brother, and also we mentioned Joab's armor bearer. It says there are 37 names in all, but only 36 names are actually mentioned, and so people believe Joab is the 37th there. Um, another name you might uh, recognize is Eliam, uh, Eliam in verse 34, who was the son of Ahithophel. Ahithophel was David's counselor, when David's son, um, who's his son, Absalom, uh, sets up this coup to overtake the throne, Ahithophel abandons David and goes with his son there. Uh, Eliam was also the father of Bathsheba. Uh, sometimes we hear names, right, that immediately, like as soon as we hear that name, it invokes certain thoughts or feelings. If you, if you hear the name Benedict Arnold, most of if you know your history, you think of treason, Right? Um, you think of, of jumping sides. If you hear Adolf Hitler, just all sorts of just evil and atrocity and genocide, megalomania. Uh, Dale Davis, one of the commentators I read on this, uh, I love the way he succinctly puts this. This list of the 30 ends with a thud. The last name mentioned is Uriah the Hittite. When we hear that name, our mind should immediately be swept back to what we see in 2 Samuel 11, which is really, it's a case study of depravity. Right? We see adultery and treachery and murder all spill out of the man after God's own heart. David was chosen by God to be a foreshadow of the ultimate king who would truly rule God's people in justice and equity. I think there is incredible purpose with this list ending the way that it does. David was such an amazing leader. He accomplished so much and, and, and had the loving devotion of so many brave and noble warriors who were willing to die for him. And the sad irony here is that Uriah, who like the others, he was willing to die for David. He's murdered by him. The wickedness of David recorded in these chapters throughout this book, it's meant to keep us, first of all, from making a hero of David or any of these guys but ultimately it is meant to drive us to the grace of God. David was a man for God's own heart, the man he was a sinner in need of a desperate savior, desperately in need of a savior. David had Bathsheba and Uriah as a stain on his past. What's your past sin or sins that come back to haunt you at times? Memories like Uriah the Hittite that they don't need listen to me church, they do not need to haunt us if they humble us instead and drive us to the mercy of Jesus Christ. So Christian, take heart. It doesn't matter what you've done. I'm not trying to lessen sin and the, the, the seriousness of it, but it doesn't matter what you've done. Maybe your life was marked by sexual immorality or drunkenness or drug use or anger or violence or a broken marriage or manipulation and deceit or any number of other vices or sins that are obvious to others or not. In the Gospels, we see Jesus welcome all sorts of people, extortionists, prostitutes, drunkards, murderers, even terrorists, Simon the Zealot. And even on top of that, Jesus welcomes 
moral, socially respectable people who have spent their lives trying to earn God's favor by their good deeds. He welcomes anyone who places their hope and trust in him. So please, church, don't let your past sins haunt you and keep you under the power of Satan. Satan is called the accuser of the brethren for a reason. Instead, let that humble you and let it drive you to look upon Jesus and find joy in his overwhelming peace and incomprehensible mercy and grace. One of my favorite verses on the board here, on the screen here, I think Mark has it, is 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, where where Paul gives us laundry list of these people who do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. He says, don't be deceived. Don't be tricked by this. And then I love verse 11. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. In closing, on the second Sunday of 2022, my encouragement for you is this, to be like David, let your past sin, let your past failure drive you to the cross of Jesus Christ to seek his grace and mercy. And then as you seek to grow more and more in your knowledge and love of God through his word, you will become more committed to his truth, more committed to his glory, so that you, like the men mentioned here, will show true courage. Stand up for the truths of God's word wherever you are placed. Proclaim the life-giving message of Jesus Christ to the people around you. And watch God work in amazing, impossible ways through your obedience. And if you're here this morning, today, and and you haven't truly surrendered your life to Jesus, you haven't trusted him for the forgiveness of your sin, for new life in him, it doesn't matter what you've done. Jesus offers hope. John 6, 37, Jesus says, Whoever comes to me, I will in no way cast out. Repent of your sin and believe in Jesus Christ and live for him. If you don't know how to do that, please talk to me, talk to Ryan, talk to somebody here. Do not put that off. Last words, my church family, in the words of Joab, Again, be of good courage and let us be courageous for our people, for the cities of our God, and may the Lord do what seems good to him. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your word. Would you help us to be courageous, to have our faith resolved in who you are and what you've done, Lord? Help us to act with boldness, to trust you and trust you with the outcome, to know that the battle belongs to the Lord. Uh, Forgive us of our complacency, of our love of comfort and our apathy. Lord, help us to fight for your kingdom as you have called us. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as the men are going to come up uh, to prepare the table, we are going to do the Lord's Supper, partake of that. So guys, if you wouldn't mind coming up for that. Um, Jesus uh, gave two ordinances to be carried out in the gathering of God's people in the local church. Uh, Baptism and the Lord's Supper. Uh, Today, we are going to celebrate the life, death, and resurrection of Christ on our behalf. Uh, At Grace, we we do practice what's called open communion. So uh, if you're not a member here, but you are a follower of Christ, you have repented of your sins and believed in him, as long as you're not under church discipline or in bad standing at your home church, you are welcome uh, to partake. Uh, Ryan, I love the way that he uh, constantly puts it, uh, is that um, this is for believers here. And so Parents, uh, it's kind of up to you uh, with your kids where they are in their walk with Christ. And so if you're not sure, it's okay for them to not take it. Uh, Let this be just a testimony of the gospel to them. Uh, That's okay. Um, The worship team is going to lead us in one more song, uh, during which, during the song, you're invited to come up to the front here. Uh, And we also have a table there uh, at the back as well. So uh, please grab those as you come and then hang on to those. And then after the first song, we will take those together. So let me pray for the um, Lord's Supper. Thank you, Father, for your your word. Thank you, Christ, uh, for coming to this earth to live a perfect life, death, and resurrection on our behalf. Would you um, prepare our hearts, God, that we would not take this uh, in in an unworthy manner, in a way that that does not glorify you, Father. If we have sin that we have not repented of, if we have something between our brother or sister, God, uh, help us to repent of that before we come here, that you would be honored as we partake of this. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
He became sin Who knew no sin That we might become His righteousness He humbled Himself And carried the cross Love so amazing Love so amazing Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, rescue for sin. from heaven Jesus Messiah Lord of all His body the bread His blood the wine broken and poured out all for love
rest alone. My hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. His cornerstone is solid ground. Firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ I stand. guilt in life, no fear of death. What's it say there? <laughs> I already forgot it. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry till final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. Church, God is sovereign, and I've heard it said before, and I love it, that 
Until God calls you home, you're invincible. Obey Him. Stand firm in that. I want to close with these words in Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 14, 13. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, stand firm. Stand firm in the promises of God, church. You are sent.